today on Against the Grain. She says we've moved beyond neoliberalism to a new modality or stage of capitalism, one in which almost all the opportunities are handed to a select group and the risks are downloaded on to the rest of us. I'm C.S. Song. The political theorist Albena Asmanova describes what she considers to be the fourth incarnation of capitalism, aggregative capitalism. After these, news headlines. Good afternoon, this is Gabriela Castellan with news headlines from the KPFA Newsroom. Uh, Senator John Kerry spoke moments ago on Capitol Hill about ISIL should, how ISIL should be stopped. We did what we have to do to beat back fascism. And I think it is a legitimate question to ask whether or not the rule of law, the norms of behavior that we fought for for all those years since World War II, uh, uh, that we're going to do our part to uphold them and to make it possible for other countries to not be subjected to the fascism and, and dictatorship and tyranny of a group like ISIL that rapes young girls and imprisons people, uh, women, and burns books and destroys schools and deprives people of uh, uh, their liberty, burns pilots, cuts off the heads of journalists, uh, and basically declares a caliphate that challenges all of the nations uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere. A federal appeals court has dismissed a lawsuit filed by hundreds of Occupy Wall Street protesters who were arrested in New York's Brooklyn Bridge in 2011 at the height of the movement against income inequality and wealth distribution. In a ruling released late yesterday, a New York appeals court reversed its own August 2014 decision, allowing the class action over alleged police misconduct to proceed. The 2011 lawsuit was filed against New York City police officers involved in arresting some 700 Occupy Wall Street protesters three days earlier during a march over the Brooklyn Bridge. Health insurer Anthem Incorporated, which earlier this month reported that hackers had breached a patient database, said today that between 8.8 million and 18.8 million customers of non-Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield plans were impacted by the attack. Anthem did not revise the total of how many customers had records that were not just seen by the hackers but stolen. University and civic leaders are convening at UC Berkeley for a national conference on campus sexual assault. Tomorrow they'll encounter a presentation that was not vetted by the event organizers, the victim's unflattering view of UC's Berkeley handling of sexual assault cases. Students are organizing a Wednesday evening protest which will feature information about rape victims who claim they didn't receive appropriate support from administrators and others after reporting their attacks. These victims believe UC Berkeley should fix its own problems before presenting itself as a leader in the movement against campus rape. One administrator is to be quoted as asking a rape victim, how many times did you say no? Two Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors are proposing a housing task force to address the homeless situation in the Silicon Valley. According to the county, an estimated 7,600 people are homeless in Santa Clara County. Supervisor and Board President David Cortese brought the proposal to a full board. Supervisor Cindy Chavez tells KPFA News she supports the move. We have a very high uh, number of people who live without homes every day in our society. We need to to change that. But in addition to that, the cost of housing is so extraordinarily high that it makes it difficult for moderate and low-income families to live here. So we have to deal with that issue. A commuter train crashed into a truck and derailed this morning, injuring dozens of people in a farmland northwest of Los Angeles. According to the Oxnard Fire Department, the collision sent three cars of the Metrolink train tumbling onto their sides. A total of 28 passengers were taken to hospitals, four with critical injuries. Authorities were questioning the truck driver, whom they said fled, and was found several miles away. For reasons that are not yet clear, fire officials said his truck was sitting on the tracks at a marked crossing around 5.44 a.m. as the train approached. 
A report released today by the State Department of Managed Health Care says that although Kaiser Permanente has improved access to its mental health appointments, 22% of Northern California patients still are having to wait too long to be seen. The report also found that some patients are being given inaccurate and misleading information about their plan's mental health coverage. More news on these and other stories at 4 p.m. and then again at 6 p.m. for the Pacifica Evening News. From the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, California, this is Against the Grain on Pacifica Radio. My name is C.S. Song. Perhaps you've heard on this program one or two or many political economists say that neoliberalism first emerged in the 1970s, that it's characterized by privatization, deregulation, and trade liberalization, and that neoliberalism remains the form of capitalism we're in today. Well, we've got a different story to tell you today, or I should say the story will be told by a European political theorist named Albena Asmanova. Albena is an associate professor in social and political thought at the University of Kent's Brussels Schools of School of International Studies in Belgium, and she's currently a visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley. She's also the author of The Scandal of Reason, A Critical Theory of Political Judgment. Albena Asmanova believes that we are in the fourth historical modality of capitalism, the first three being the entrepreneurial capitalism of the 19th century, the capitalism of the post-World War II welfare state, and the neoliberal capitalism of the late 20th century. She assigns great importance to the degree to which each version of capitalism gained legitimacy, and also to the way each doled out risks and opportunities. Albena calls the current stage of capitalism, which she says began well before the recent economic meltdown, she calls it aggregative capitalism. When Albena sat down with me recently in studio, I noted that she'd recently written that capitalism's prospects have rarely seemed gloomier, and I asked her to elaborate. Yes, we seem to be approaching a revolutionary moment about 2010. And it is not simply because the financial crisis turned into economic crisis, turned into social crisis through unemployment, and many people's lives were wrecked. But there was more. There were elites were aware that there was a big moment of change, of mistrust in capitalism. Even the Financial Times, this bastion of capitalist intellectual life, uh, pronounced capitalism on its deathbed. It wrote, um, it commented on David Harvey's uh, book on the Christ of Capitalism, The Enigma of Capital and the Christ of Capitalism. It described it as a deftly time call for the overthrow of capitalism. So there was, we had also this, the, the, such movements as Occupy and the Indignados in Spain and the protests in Greece. So there seemed to be a momentum uh, of a consensus that many forces were uniting in their uh, withdrawing their support to democratic capitalism as we knew it. Moreover, there were many people, especially sociological studies, surveys, revealed that growing numbers of people were declaring that they did not want this life. What I mean are that even uh, at the best jobs, the best paid jobs, the most satisfying jobs, were declaring that there is so much work pressure, so much stress related to work, that what they wanted is a better balance between uh, work, not just work family, as we used to uh, bang about, but work family and leisure. So a growing number of people, the poor and the rich, across the, the political spectrum seem to be coming to an awareness that this model should go, is ready to go. Even in policy circles, um, politicians, wise academics, uh, were discussing that the neoliberal policies of um, deregulation, liberalization, open markets 
are what brought this crisis on us and had to be changed. However, and here is the paradox, voters, although they had declared in surveys that they wanted to live differently, that they were ready to valorize, to value and to produce their life and to live their life differently, voters in the um, Western Europe especially, at the nadir of the economic crisis, 2008-2009, they voted for the economically liberal parties that actually brought the economy to its knees. Now, why is that? I mean, it, does that signify the lack of, a, of an alternative in terms of uh, parties and candidates in Western Europe, or is there some other factor? I'm ready to, to claim that there are alternatives, and I'm ready even to discuss them. But to come to the point of explaining this paradox that there was no this second movement against the markets. You might uh, remember how Karl Polanyi was um, describing that um, counter-movement against the self-regulating market that grew gradually from all kinds of social forces in the 19th century and ended up with the welfare state of the second, uh, after the Second World War. So Kalpwani was, in the Great First Transformation, in his book, was describing not only that there is uh, the working class, but also merchants, bankers, um, the socialists, the, the conservative parties, they were all pushing for social protection against uh, this movement. Now elites are pressing with the same policies, but also social protest is phrased in a very conservative manner. What I found heartbreaking was uh, watching uh, this, um, the indignados in Spain, this beautiful, inspired young people who are seeing you know, their, their future going away as uh, unemployment in Spain was among the young was going up to 40, 50 percent. Their slogan was, we're not against the system, the system is against us. This is deeply conservative, even reactionary in nature. We want, you know, better capitalism. We don't want an overhaul of the model. Um, so you ask me, why is that? And to answer that question, I still want to remind us of something missing. What is missing, remember what happened in 68. Okay, in 68, in the 60s, there was a radical imagination. The students at the Sorbonne in, in Paris they were not saying we are not against the system, the system is against us. They had slogans such as uh, be realistic, uh, believe in the impossible. So there was a viable alternative social imaginary, which we are missing now. So this paradox is what we need to understand. And my answer is that while we have been debating, fearing or celebrating the crisis of capitalism, Capitalism has meanwhile transformed, mutated into a new modality, which, according to the book I'm writing now about the fourth, uh, the four lives and times of capitalism, followed the liberal capitalism of the 19th century, the so-called social capitalism, or organized capitalism of the after the Second World War, the neoliberal capitalism of the late 20th century, and so I'm arguing that we have entered in the fourth type of capitalism, which is even darker and more exploitative and more destructive to human nature and to natural resources than uh, neoliberal capitalism. Well, let's lay a foundation for your explanation, your description of what kind of capitalism we are in today by going back to the first phase, the first kind, the first modality of capitalism, which, as you said, is called liberal or entrepreneurial capitalism. What were the main features of this kind of capitalism, which I take it prevailed in the 19th century? Well, typically, there the state or the public authority was trying to create the, the legal framework for to enable people to undertake 
new production to undertake to become capitalists, to engage in the production of goods uh, and services. So the way it was done was through securing contract law, private property, and the state didn't do much more than that. Then it unleashed a process of the proletarization of the working class. We're, we're familiar with that story. So the, the freedom of enterprise at that time was coupled with its dark side, um, well, freedom of enterprise, including what John Locke celebrated as the freedom for, of human creativity expressed in the production, in the launching of, of new products and new services. But the dark side of, of that, of course, was the commodification of labor and all the wreckage it did to human nature and to societies. So this would be called laissez-faire capitalism? It's laissez-faire capitalism, exactly. And you focus in your writings on an interesting relationship that not a lot of people articulate between risk and opportunity. So in what ways were risk and opportunity correlated in this first phase of capitalism? Right. Um, the relationship between risk and opportunity of the correlation has much to do with the capacity of capitalism to legitimate itself. We are often being told the story that massive support for capitalism comes from its promise to create wealth for everyone. There is this fundamental belief in the spirit that supports capitalism that whoever undertakes a risk, for instance, investing of resources into launching a new product, they're entitled to the opportunity, they're, they're rewarded with wealth. So capitalism is a fair play only when it correlates properly risk and opportunity. And much of the popular support to that, apart from the creation of, of, of wealth for society, is based on this. Because if wealth is not created in this fair way, it stops to be acceptable to people. So in this first phase, was there a kind of correlation between risk and opportunity that legitimated that phase of capitalism in people's eyes? Well, theoretically, it was supposed to do so, but of course it didn't play out to be so because nobody imagined at the, at the launching of capitalism that it would create so much wreckage in terms of the exploitation of child labor, um, women being tasked with production that they could not bear, um, long working hours and what did it did to, to human nature. So as this kind of risks became more obvious, society reacted. And as I said, this reaction w did not come just from the workers who are mobilizing against capital. Um, if uh, we do trust uh, this splendid narrative of Karl Polanyi about Britain at that time, um, actually, there were, you know, even the, the, the merchants and, and banks and, and all kinds of social force, including the Catholic Church, which started to, to resist that and said, this is a social risk that is too much and something needs to be done. And this is exactly what the welfare state after the Second World War accepted as its legitimate function to offset social risk by spreading a social safety net, such as limitation to working hours, limitation to working lives, pensions, uh, health care, in Europe, uh, free education. So then risk and opportunities aligned and there was this pact, this social contract underpinning democratic capitalism that lasted for about 30 years. Albena Asmanova joins me in studio on Against the Grain on Pacifica Radio. My name is C.S. Song. She is Associate Professor in Social and Political Thought at the University of Kent at Brussels, Belgium. She's currently a visiting scholar at University of California, Berkeley. Okay, so in the first phase of capitalism, there's a stress on freedom of enterprise under individual initiative, the autonomy of the individual. Then, as you say, after World War II, another kind of capitalism, what's called organized capitalism, came into place. So are you saying that under this second modality of capitalism, the focus was on, in a sense, protecting society from the market, protecting it from what the market had done to society in earlier years and decades? Exactly. There was this mass shared belief that the state had 
social responsibility. It had to offset the social risks of capital, of the game of capitalistic creation of profit. But probably that protection went even too far. Uh, forces even on the left, such as the Frankfurt School people, uh, Frankfurt School, this is a school of thought that emerged in Frankfurt uh, around the 30s, started to criticize this capitalism for being too bureaucratic, for crushing the human soul. You might remember there is this line in a, a song from uh, Janis Joplin about those times. You took away not only our rights, but also our wrongs. You uh, Individuals were crushed under the bureaucratic logic of this welfare capitalism, which, uh, uh, remember, it was called the nanny state. Um, so if we, in the first formation of capitalism, if we call the state, I call it teenager state in one publication, because the state tries to, to enable the teenager to launch its uh, independent life. In the second stage, the nanny state is telling us what to do and what not to do, how to be happy. Uh, so there was a, 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 not only critique from the right that this deal between labor and capital that, uh, under pinning democratic capitalism was um, inefficient because it put constraints on capital. But uh, on the left, the criticism was that it was crushing individual initiative. It was crushing our freedoms. So uh, this format of the social contract started to come under pressure both from the left and the right around the 70s. And so what happened in the 70s such that the modality, the form, the kind of capitalism shifted to what we now call neoliberal capitalism? Um, I, I will not explain the crisis of the 70s. We, we, all, uh, we are all aware of that. But, uh, of course, political answers to crisis can vary. The answer was privatization. By, by then, a lot of the key economies of Europe were in public hands, uh, especially infrastructure, uh, gas and electricity. All the important uh, companies were in state hands, so privatization, then deregulation of the economy, you know, lifting um, the regulatory limits to expansion of uh, capitalist enterprise, which eventually, towards the end of the 20th century, allowed many companies uh, to exploit rent, because competition, if you are not exposed to competition, you um, are in a privileged position, that is the risk opportunity balance is not, doesn't play anymore for you. You have uh, less risk because you are exposed to less competition and you reap the benefits, uh, the opportunities for wealth creation much more. Uh, and the third trajectory was increasing, was market openness. So endorsing globalization. Remember the, the late of the 90s were uh, a decade of increased integration of national markets into the global economy. So we have these three trajectories, privatization, deregulation, and opening of markets to global competition that launched the new liberal formation. And what happened to the government's focus in the earlier modality of capitalism on taking care of people, providing for their welfare, protecting them from the market? Now, the state under this third formation, and I call that state uh, the stepmother state, it uh, plays a, a hands-off game. It uh, pushes uh, also through regulation, uh, but it pushes more of the responsibility uh, for social integration, for even for, for uh, national security to the market. And also it pushes a responsibility to individuals. We had all to become responsible not only for finding employment with um, the new policy of uh, labor market activation, it is called, not only uh, to uh, find employment, but, but to stay employable. Workers were pushed to, um, if they couldn't find a job, they had to undergo training, they had to stay employable all the time, but this responsibility was pushed on to individuals. We all had to start drinking our carrot juice and <laughs> um, do our jogging before uh, we enter the, the companies and become uh, more efficient and, and, and better workers. So what, what this neoliberal state does is 
takes it distance but still supervise society and push more responsibility to the citizens. Interestingly, public expenditure did not shrink. Social services, expenditure on social services and on redistribution went down, but the state invested a lot, especially in disciplinary policy, in surveillance, safety, also in, in, in the taking care of the general public, um, building parks. Uh, in Spain, there was a lot of investment in um, the tourist industry, building uh, museums and, and, and parks. But if you notice what is happening here, the, the state is not offsetting the risk. It is no longer, um, it is taking generally care of the public, but is not offsetting the risk that is accumulating to those with Less, least chances uh, for, to profit from this uh, global uh, openness and uh, free markets. I'm CS. This is Against the Grain on Pacifica Radio. Albena Osmanova joins me. She teaches political and social theory at the University of Kent's Brussels Schools and in International Studies. That's in Belgium. Her most recent book is The Scandal of Reason, A Critical Theory of Political Judgment. And her research and writing focuses on democratization, social justice, sustainable development, the EU constitution, and the transformation of political ideologies. So, Albena, you're describing some of the main features of the neoliberal capitalist state, to which I say, and to which really probably the majority of commentators on this program have said, well, that's what we're still in. We're, we're still in this era of order and securitization. We're still in this era of responsibilities being downloaded onto the individual. The individual now has to sort of take care of himself or herself and, and uh, project him or herself into the, the job market. Uh, we're still in this kind of harsh treatment of society and the lack of government support for social services. So in what sense... Are you arguing that we've moved really kind of beyond neoliberalism into something else? Yes, um, I'm not saying that uh, there's a rupture among all these modalities. Their configuration of the same repertoire of capitalism, of competitive production of profit. However, I find that it is no longer helpful to talk about neoliberal capitalism, although all of these things are still there because something else is also happening, which has very deep implications. Um, so there is a new function of the public authority, and this new function is a redistributive one. So the state no longer administers only this provision of safety, and public service while individuals are left on themselves to cope with employment and social integration. But the state, under the pressures or under the excuse of uh, global economic integration, uh, the, the monster of globalization, has taken on itself to increase the opportunities for those who are already have a competitive advantage, such as banks, big companies, big corporations, and outsource the risk to society. So the state has taken an active role of redistribution, but not to offset risk, actually to accumulate the risk to society and to advantage even further uh, those with a competitive advantage. Why? Because uh, there is this policy dogma of national competitiveness in the global market. Now, if in the previous formations, when, let's say, when the Bretton Woods system was set up after the Second World War, the wealthy democracies, they established this global market openness of their economies in the hope that this would help growth and redistribution. So globalization then, or global market openness, was a condition for that old game that underpinned democratic capitalism of growth and redistribution and creating happy consumers and happy workers. Since year, the year 2000, and I'm more familiar with the European context, um, global economic integration and therefore global competitiveness has become a policy dogma that trumps 
everything else. Um, it is the policy priority. For instance, the European Union adopted the so-called Lisbon Agenda in year 2000, pledging to make uh, the European economy uh, by year 2020 the most competitive economy uh, in the global market. Uh, and there have been reiterations of that policy agenda uh, too by now, where this priority becomes ev ever more visible and, and important. Um, so, in the name of national competitiveness, the state is not only withdrawing redistribution, its uh, redistributive functions from the previous formations, from the previous incarnations of capitalism, but is redistributing to those who already have opportunities. Does this tie into the rhetoric we often heard about, you know, too big to fail, there are these banks and we can't let them fail because other because they're so important maybe not just to the national economy but to the international economy absolutely uh, and people became aware of that but these things were happening already before um, for instance in the european union uh, countries uh, were pushing to create national champions by making finances or, or giving tax breaks to companies let me give an example of one uh, very strange uh, policy, for instance, when uh, still um, Nicolas Sarkozy was French president, in order to stimulate uh, the economy, he um, issued uh, by decree that all workers uh, should uh, be given a bonus of a thousand euro. However, not all workers, only the workers in the biggest companies listed on the so-called uh, CAC uh, 40 list of uh, the French stock exchange. So this is another example of giving push to those who already have a competitive advantage for the sake of motivating those workers to work even better in those companies on which the French success in the global economy was uh, dependent. And... Um, Actually, there are more and more complaints uh, at the European Court of Justice concerning state aid to economic uh, companies. Um, so there is, and, and this precedes the economic crisis. This is my point that this new modality of capitalism was not created by the crisis. It was consolidated by the crisis. I see its genesis at around the turn of the century. So if the state is then helping it's actually privileging giving privilege treatment to certain workers for example in that french example you just mentioned and is giving privilege treatment to only certain companies and firms that it sees as key to keeping the nation's economy competitive in the global capitalist system then what does that do to the strong temptation a lot of people on the left would have of saying that capital is the winner and labor is the loser in this new form of capitalism? Uh, well, the labor capital clash that was defining uh, a lot of um, the politics of the 20th century no longer holds exactly because there is a labor capital alliance in specific sectors of the economy. Small businesses are losing out of the competition against the big businesses because they cannot profit from their exposure to the competitive pressures of the global economy. So this is probably the curse that labor is divided and capital is divided. So these coalitions in favor uh, of the new, f new formation of capitalism that I call aggregative capitalism because the risks and opportunities are aggregated to specific players, this cuts across labor and capital and that has been the problem of the left. That's Albena Asmanova. She is Associate Professor in Social and Political Thought at the University of Kent at Brussels, Belgium. We have a link on our website to her faculty page there, as well as to her book, The Scandal of Reason, A Critical Theory of Political Judgment, as well as to her co-edited volume, Reclaiming Democracy, Judgment, Responsibility, and the Right to Politics. We'll take a short break and speak more with Albena. Please stay with us. And this is Against the Grain on Pacifica Radio. I'm C.S. Song, and joining me in studio is Albena Asmanova. 
She teaches political and social theory at the University of Kent's Brussels School in International Studies in Belgium, and she's currently a visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley. So we were talking earlier about not just capitalist systems or capitalist formations, but also the legitimacy of such formations in the eyes of the people, in the eyes of people whose obedience capitalist systems depend on in order to to run smoothly. So if we look at the legitimacy of the current, in your view, system of aggregative capitalism, what should be said about the degree to which people see this government, this kind of public authority as legitimate and as either worth supporting or worth mobilizing against? This is exactly the paradox. Risks and opportunities are clearly no longer aligned. So there is a complete disbalance. Um, Public authority is uh, um, implementing more and more policies for market efficiency, creating huge risk for society, but doing nothing to offset that risk. So we should be having a revolution because the legitimacy of the system is gone, but this is not happening. And this has been my effort to understand and explain. So let me try in this way. Not every social grievance, social unhappiness, um, discomfort, not all of these, um, the hurt of society is translated as a political claim. This is what I call that we need to pay attention to this process of politicization. And this process of politicization of the social discomfort into a political protest is mediated or passes through what people perceive as political deliverables. That is, public authority should provide these things to society because they're desirable, for instance, such as social safety net, less risk, less exposure to global market pressures, uh, less uh, stress on the job. So these deliverables have two features. They're desirable, but also populations must think that these things are possible, that public authority can actually deliver them. And what surveys have showed that the more the market is open, the more a national market is open, the less the electorate in these countries holds elites responsible for economic policy and therefore for the social consequences of that policy. Basically, in the context of global economic competition, people have given up the hope and expectation that public authority can do something about economic policy and social policy. And basically, citizens have absolved public authority from social responsibility effectively. And, of course, there is the story that we have all become brainwashed into obedient workers and consumers. But I take my distance from um, those critiques of neoliberal capitalism. There is much of that going on, but people are not so stupid. There is something else uh, going on, and this is that... As people have become more responsible for their employability, but also as this global economic competition is putting a pressure on everybody to work more for the sake of keeping the job. And what is a job? It is our livelihood. We have no more sources for maintaining a lifestyle or even providing for our basic needs than the job. So there's this is what I describe as the main contradiction of contemporary capitalism. If you think of it, technological progress is amazing. It's just magnanimous advancement of technological process. Keynes wrote in 1930 an article called The Economic Prospects of Our Grandchildren saying that within a hundred years easily our technological development would be so advanced that we would take one third of our of the time we we, we take now back then in the 30s to, to satisfy our basic needs so people should have much more leisure and much less uh, uh, being hooked to this capitalist process of 
production and, and, and redistribution and consumption. But this is not happening exactly because the jobs for everybody have become in, insecure, not just for the people with the bad and poorly paid jobs, but also for the people with the good jobs, the labor market insiders. So this is the contradiction of contemporary capitalism that we have this unprecedented opportunity for decommodification, that is for no longer of having a human life depend on having a job, on being hooked into uh, the economy. But the pressures for commodification, that is to stay employed and employable for absolutely everybody, what I call the 99% who don't want to be in, but they must be in in order to survive, uh, these pressures uh, have also increased um, magnanimously, uh, and it is the fear of losing a job, the fear of, of falling behind, that is making people more conservative, um, although they, they, they feel the discomfort of, of, of this life, of, of wasting our um, creativity into jobs that a lot of people dislike, or even if you like, you don't want to be spending all your life on that job. So those pressures are making people more conservative rather than uh, more liberated to indulge in an uh, imagination for alternative lives. But wouldn't greater insecurity, economic insecurity, job insecurity, wouldn't that incline people to ask more of government to say, look, government, you need to come in and do something and make our lives better? There's a history of this to some degree in, under capitalism. Can you do this now? Well, sure, it makes sense. Uh, but let's see why it is not happening. I believe it should be happening, and this is what... A renewed left uh, should be taking this discourse. But what, what's happening on the left is see uh, both on the left and, and this alternative right movements um, are appealing to the democratization of everyday life. And they're, they're being captured by this new liberal discourse of absolving the state from um, responsibilities in the name of democracy. So actually the left is compounding the problem rather than offering a solution. We need to pressure public authority, uh, and that's not on the state level in Europe. I believe public authority on the level of the European Union to do more social protection, to create what I call the economy of trust. But, but in what ways is the rhetoric of democracy, for example, in Europe, taking pressure off of public authorities, absolving them of some kind of responsibility in people's eyes to take care of the populace? When we say democracy, we mean self-government. So it's a very easy move, logical move, uh, to say we are responsible for our existence. We have to take care of our lives. Um, I, let me give an example. Um, so the Council of Europe adopted recently a charter for shared social responsibility. And I, I participated in um, some of the discussions um, as the charter was elaborated. And there in the drafts I, I noticed uh, this very prominent discourse uh, that as the state cannot fulfill its social responsibilities anymore because it doesn't have the means, we all have to become more responsible for our well-being. So to be good Democrats, we have to take more responsibility and share responsibility. The, the poor have to become responsible for their poverty and so on. Uh, so it's it's a very dangerous move to absolve the state from responsibility in the name of self-government, in the name of democracy. Um, why? Why is that? Simply because social existence is a very complex thing. You cannot make people responsible for things that they cannot effectively be responsible for. This only creates fear and we, we indulge on the logic of escape from freedom out of fear as we see the mobilization of this new populism, both from the left and the right. People are afraid for the loss of their livelihoods and they're expressing that concern, that legitimate concern, in the wrong way. Back to my point about the politicization, that very legitimate grievance, which the left should actually address, is being instead politicized, expressed in the political terms of xenophobia, a fear of the stranger, of 
Islamophobia now, the upsurge of Islamophobia, I believe, is very much part of this larger economic anxiety. I'm CS. This is Against the Grain on Pacifica Radio. Her name is Albena Azmanova. She is normally based in Brussels, Belgium, at the University of Kent's Brussels School in International Studies, where she teaches social and political theory. She is author of The Scandal of Reason, A Critical Theory of Political Judgment, and her new book is, she's a co-editor of the volume, Reclaiming Democracy, Judgment, Responsibility, and the Right to Politics. So hearing you talk about sort of this crisis of social mobilization, or I should say the lack of social mobilization against the status quo, because we're, that's what we're trying to explore here partly, which is why aren't people rising up and revolting against this revolting system, this latest iteration of capitalism. Uh, many people, and I'm going to bring it up here, would point to challenges to austerity, notably in uh, Greece, for example, with the ascendance of the leftist Syriza party. You have other formations like Podemos in Spain. I mean, do you see these as challenges to the current political economic status quo? These formations, and I, I really sympathize with Syriza, but to be fair, they, what they do very well is opening the horizon of possibilities, reclaiming what I call the, our right to politics. We, ha, we cannot accept this dogma that there is no alternative Tina logic that Margaret Thatcher uh, launched back in the 80s and has remained valid till now. Uh, we all told that there are no alternatives to the politics of austerity and deregulation, liberalization, of uh, labor markets and and product markets so what the social protest has done a good job on is to open that horizon to break that horizon and say no there are alternatives so they're reclaiming a very important right we didn't know we had before we lost it and this is the right to politics however they're not advocating a radical overhaul of the model within which we want less austerity of the model in which we want more equality. This is what is not being questioned. And maybe I, I should explain um, what I mean because it, it seems important to me in what way we should be looking for alternatives. Now let's take the critique of capitalism uh, that we inherited from Marx and Georg Lukács. There are two trajectories in which Marx describes oppression and domination and injustice. The injustice of exploitation. The worker is weaker vis-à-vis -vis the capitalist because the worker doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the ownership of the means of production. So this is what I call relational inequality. Some people have less power than others, so they're unequal within a certain model of well-being. But Marx also wrote about alienation. And this is not the same logic in which people suffer. Because alienation is brought about by the submission of absolutely everybody, even of the, those who own the means of production, the capitalists, the bourgeoisie, the enemy. Even these people are submitted to the productivist imperative and pressures of capitalism. So... When Marx describes that alternative way of, of being when you are in, in the morning a fisherman and, and, and you are a worker in the afternoon and you are an intellectual in the evening, this, this model of, of having a fuller life, that means that we need changes both on the level of the relational but also on what I call the systemic logic. So these calls of the Occupy movements um, against inequality, the calls of the 99% uh, against the privileges of the 1%, um, calls against austerity, calls for, even calls for women's equality with men on the labor market. These are very valid, very important calls for equality within certain model of well-being. But what we need and what it's time, and I believe it's really, we have the means to do it now, if, if more than any time before, 
is to question the whole model of well-being. We're ready. You've written that a solution to the constellation of problems you've outlined might come in the form of what you call a political economy of trust. What do you mean by that term? Um, right. So companies are not investing because they're insecure. People are not spending because they're insecure. So everybody is working more because they are uncertain they might have a job tomorrow. So what we need to do is to have another safety net, but I don't believe that that safety net should come through, uh, although I'm not opposed to um, a redistribution. We need to um, throw a new safety net, for instance, starting with the nationalization or bringing back into public hands those companies which cannot be properly exposed to competition. Companies which exploit rent don't belong to capitalism. This is against the very logic of capitalist competition. So, And, and by rent you mean profits from profit, investments? Profits from investment without proper exposure to risk because um, such as big banks, um, gas and electricity, uh, railways, Everything that is deemed essential for society is a public utility and it should go into public hands. Uh, at the same time, allowing free competition on a smaller scale, of course, for people to be able to express their creativity uh, in the production process if they so wish. Um, at the same time, it is very important that the social safety net, that is unemployment, then minimal, uh, some sort of minimal income, is not linked to your participation in the labor market, for instance, the way it is done in uh, the Nordic countries of Europe, uh, where social provision is not predicated on the employment contract like in Germany, but is predicated on national citizenship. So I propose that social provision, social safety is based on European denizenship. I, I'm not using the, the word citizenship because a lot of people live in Europe without being citizens, but on European denizenship. Then people would have the, the safety to dream big and the companies would have the security of investing and venturing uh, into the risks they have to take in order to make the economy prosperous. Uh, so we could be setting up uh, what I've proposed as um, European uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, those companies who are in, that are in public hands would be run uh, in a competitive way in the global economy, but the profits should go back in order to fill up this social safety fund that would provide the, the safety net to people. Is what you're suggesting a break from capitalism? It would be a break from capitalism in the sense that if capitalism is defined as the competitive production of profit and that mechanism is supposed to also provide social integration, then it is a break from capitalism because this would be substantial stepping away from the competitive production of profit. People's lives would not depend on that and the market would not be playing the role of social integration. So, Albena, your focus is, of course, Europe. You're based in Brussels. There's a lot of hand-wringing about the rise of Eurosceptic parties in Europe, seen, for example, in the um, by how well these parties did in the last elections for the European Parliament. How alarmed are you by the, the rise of these formations and by the success of a lot of these fringe parties in the political landscape? Well, in some ways I celebrate the rise of these parties because they're bringing alternatives, they're challenging the status quo, they're bringing back to us the awareness that we're entitled to a right to politics, to a right of contestation and alternatives. Moreover, in my reading, these parties... Um, what I mean is this new populist, uh, extreme left, extreme right parties that have been rejected as uh, being non-democratic, uh, especially because of, of their uh, xenophobia. This is simply the wrong politicization of a very important grievance, is that 
current economic policy is taking people's lives away. So my actually my hope is that these parties might pressure the center-left and the center-right establishment to do something serious about um, addressing the concerns of these people. Unfortunately, what uh, the center-left and center-right are doing are taking that discourse, the xenophobic discourse, and mainstreaming it. Um, remember that um, a slogan of the British Prime Minister, the Labour Prime Minister, uh, British jobs for British workers. This is exactly mainstreaming the economic xenophobia that is being brought up by this frustrated um, electorate of the extreme left and extreme right, which I see as mobilizing around the new poll, the, the risk poll, um, and they're taking that discourse in a very dangerous way and being mainstreaming it in the policies of the center-left and center-right establishment, which are forming another poll, which I call the opportunity poll, because the center-left and the center-right and the green uh, have been united behind this feeling, this perception of globalization is bringing more opportunities than risks. But you know, their opponents now are people who are experiencing the risks side of the opportunity risk divide. Albena Azmanova, she is Associate Professor in Social and Political Thought at the University of Kent at Brussels, Belgium. We've put links on againstofthegrain.org to her book, The Scandal of Reason, as well as to her co-edited volume, Reclaiming Democracy. Thanks, Albena, so much for joining me. Thank you. Pleasure. And this is Sia suggesting the important thing is not to stop questioning, and we hope you'll join us next time.